After a sudden lapse of breath, you awaken to another dimension full of rife and danger. Encountering demonic entities, navigating waterways, facing vigorous challenges by navigating the black eternal abyss of the underworld becomes a duty for all the deceased. At the end of all the pain and suffering thrown against them, they are promised a life of eternity, never worrying about food and thirst, but to live among the gods and become one with the cosmos itself. Welcome to the afterlife of the Egyptians, where the challenges and hardship encountered will be rewarded with truthfulness. The Egyptians had developed and changed their views of the afterlife from prehistory to the end of the Pharaonic Age and towards Christianity. From the pyramids to their mummified burial practices, they were not obsessed with death but how to overcome it. The pyramids were built for the purpose of the king's resurrection, and mummies are homes for the undying spirits. These preparations for death can be dated back to the earliest prehistoric civilizations of Egypt. There have been several texts and funerary practices through history that were updated due to the evolution of their beliefs. New beliefs would appear after the collapse of the Old Kingdom during the years 2175 to 1970 BCE and would survive to the end of the Pharaonic civilization. The oldest and most influential of all religious texts in Egypt are the Pyramid Texts, dating back to the Old Kingdom which lasted from 2575 to 2125 BCE. They contain prayers, spells, and hymns that all help the dead navigate the underworld. These texts played an important role in royal funerals as they were recited by priests and referenced their future life if they reached immortality. It was believed that reciting these texts would ensure passage to the next world. With the chanting of these spells and hymns, it would grant the dead the ability to overcome enemies, the power to resist corruption, and a new body if they were to pass the trials successfully. Another text with sections composed before the first king of Egypt is known to us today as the Book of the Dead. The oldest form of the book can be traced back to the first dynasty and was revised before the first king, Mena. These revisions are older than 5,000 years. There are multiple versions of the Book of the Dead, but the Papyrus of Ani is the best preserved version. Much like the Pyramid Texts, the Book of the Dead is used for symbolic funerary purposes that includes prayers, magic, and spells. These would be chanted at the burial of the dead in hopes for protection to be granted in the underworld. This is one of the more important texts in Egyptian culture as it stood the test of time through 3,000 years until the end of Pharaohs. I will read a small section from the first plate from the Book of the Dead. Adoration of Ra, when riseth he in horizon eastern of heaven. Behold Osiris, the scribe of the holy offerings of the gods, all Ani. Saith he, homage to thee, who hast come as Kapara, Kapara as the creator of the gods. Thou riseth, thou shinest, making bright thy mother, crowned as king of the gods, doeth to thee, mother newt, with her two hands the act of worship. Receiveth thee, Manu, with content, embraceth thee, Ma'at, at the double season. May he give splendor and power together with triumph, and a coming forth as a soul living to see Horus of the double horizon, to the Ka of Osiris, the scribe Ani, triumphant before Osiris. Saith he, Hail gods all of the soul temple, ye weighers of heaven and earth in the balance, givers of food and abundance of meat. Hail Tatunin, one maker of mankind and of the substance of the gods of the south, north, west, and east. There are also the Coffin Texts, which are an extension of both the Pyramid Texts and the Book of the Dead, containing 1,185 spells that were placed directly on the coffins of the dead. These spells were thought to have given the dead various advantages when navigating the underworld and undergoing its trials. Before there was an afterlife for any Egyptian citizen, resurrection was only reserved for the king. This was because the king was seen as the only one who had the influence, knowledge, and rank to access the celestial realm. It was up to the citizens of Egypt to help the king reach the divine status that would be awarded to him after death. One of these kings to have the Egyptians build such an elaborate tomb for himself was the king Unas of the 5th dynasty during the years 2350 and 2325 BCE. During his reign, he had ordered the building of his own pyramid near the net Yeriket's Step Pyramid, and elaborate chambers were built beneath it. Unas's coffin was painted black and symbolized the earth, 
and the ceiling of his chamber contained golden stars with dark blue paint surrounding it. The walls were white alabaster that were grooved and painted. His chambers were meant to resemble the universe itself, but his decoration didn't stop there. Passages from the pyramid texts were inscribed on columns in the anteroom and the chamber and were painted blue to resemble the underworld. This was the first time anyone had the pyramid texts inscribed in their own tomb, as the spells or incantations would normally be recited from priests. The texts based on the underworld were found in the burial chamber, as the antechamber was meant to be the place of rebirth. The texts were inscribed on the columns because it was thought to have enhanced the magical properties of Unas' resurrection. But the pyramid texts weren't added to ensure his resurrection. Since Unas was a king of Egypt, he was seen to command obedience from everybody including the gods. A new hymn, now included in the pyramid texts, was written about him achieving his status of immortality. The hymn created was called the Cannibal Hymn. Unas is he who eats people, who lives on the gods. Unas is he who eats their magic, swallows their spirits. Their big ones are for his morning meal, their middle ones for his evening meal, their little ones for his night meal, their old males and females for his burnt offering. The afterlife for ordinary citizens wouldn't exist until after Pepe II's reign in 2325 to 2150 BCE, his half-sister Neith had inscribed spells in her own pyramid and that knowledge had spread throughout Egypt. Now that this knowledge was accessible to the ordinary Egyptian, success and being remembered during their lives were no longer enough. They too wanted to live eternally and hoped for a better life after death. Some examples soon after the information of the spells got out were that of the governor Mendunifer, who was laid to rest with a copy of the pyramid texts. In the next generation, one official decorated his tomb walls with the same incantations of the pyramid texts found in Unas's chamber. Later, administrators would inscribe pyramid texts on their coffins. Soon enough, all Egyptians would have the chance to live eternally in the afterlife. Their customs would change tenfold as the cult of Osiris spread its way across Egypt. The cult of Osiris originated from Lower Egypt and spread its way to the town of Jadu. In Jadu, they worshipped Anjedi, who was their ruler and resurrected himself like Osiris. But as Osiris became popular, Anjedi was quickly forgotten and Jadu became the main center for worshipping Osiris. Continuing from Jadu, the cult made its way to Abju, located in southern Egypt. In Abju, they worshipped a funerary god in the shape of a jackal. Their temple, Kenti Amentu, meaning foremost of the westerners, was the guardian of the west and lord of the necropolis. The cult of Osiris would eventually replace these roles by the 11th dynasty, as inscriptions found at the temple of Abju mention a hybrid god named Osiris Kenti Amentu. A few generations later would see the temple solely for Osiris. Abju then became the center for the cult because of its history as the burial place of early Egyptian kings. Abju would also become a place for celebration during the reign of King Mentuhotep II in the years 2008 to 1957 BCE after a civil war in Egypt. These celebrations would be called the Mysteries of Osiris and were performed annually for a large crowd for people all over Egypt. There were three parts to the ceremony, a reenactment of the god's kingship, death, and resurrection. It would become a goal for every Egyptian to visit Abju and see the ceremony for themselves, but it would prove difficult as there weren't people to tend to their farmland, even if they had the money to travel. But for those that were able to go, it was seen as a pilgrimage like that of Jerusalem or Mecca in Christianity and Islam. For those that couldn't make it to Abju, there were festivals in local cemeteries by priests. These festivals weren't as prestigious, but offered magical benefits that could promise them eternal life. This is the first time in Egyptian history where the entire country had a soul developing religion. As the coffin texts began to die out, new views of what awaited in the afterlife emerged. As someone died, their body got ready for mummification. This was to preserve the body in a recognizable form for as long as possible. The process would take 70 days and the priests, working as embalmers, needed knowledge of human anatomy. Organs would need to be removed to decrease the decay. The brain was removed by inserting a hooked instrument through the nose to pull out brain tissue. The embalmers needed to be careful here as this process could easily disfigure the face. After the brain was removed, a cut on the left side of the abdomen was made to retrieve the organs there. The only organ left in its original place was the heart, which was seen to be the center of someone's soul and intelligence. 
After the organs were retrieved, the stomach, liver, lungs, and intestines were placed in canopic jars which were buried with the deceased. In later practices, the organs would be wrapped and placed back in the body. After the organs were dealt with, the body needed to be moisture free. The embalmers did this by covering the entire body with natron, which is a type of salt known to absorb moisture. They even placed natron packets inside the body. Once the drying process was complete, the embalmers removed the packets and washed off the salt. After the entire process was complete, the body had the appearance of a dried out human but recognizable. The embalmers made the mummy look more human by adding linen or other materials to sunken areas of the body. They even added false eyes to the body. After the body was complete, the wrapping would then begin. Each dead body needed hundreds of yards of linen to cover them entirely. The priests would then take long strips of linen and wrap it around the body. In some cases, each finger and toe were wrapped separately before the hand or foot. Passages from the pyramid texts and the Book of the Dead were written on some of the linen straps. Occasionally, a mask of the dead person's face was placed in between the linen that was then covered in warm resin. Then the priests would continue wrapping. A final cloth was placed and secured with additional linen straps as the mummy was now complete. As the cult of Osiris became incorporated into all Egyptian society, the Egyptians didn't want to be bandaged to look like themselves anymore. They wanted to look like Osiris. The corpse was then covered head to toe in bandages until the dead were wrapped in a classic mummy cocoon, but these mummies from the Middle Kingdom didn't hold up nearly as well. The brain was left inside the skull, organs were left inside the body, the body wasn't dried, and expensive ointments led to faster decomposition. This was ultimately due to religion replacing material needs. Material needs in the sense that tombs before the cult of Osiris had a vast number of decorations from people such as bakers, brewers, potters, carpenters, metalworkers, fishermen, offering bearers bringing meat, furniture, and other luxury goods. These were all placed in the tomb to help the dead person in the afterlife. But now, a functioning body was a lesser concern than having a passport to the underworld by looking like Osiris. After death, it was believed that the soul would enter the underworld, a dark and dangerous place where the deceased would face many demons, trek across waterways, and solve complex obstacles. First, the deceased would appear in what is called the Island of Fire, where the corrupted people would be consumed by flames, but the good souls were given water for their journey across the underworld. There are two beliefs in what awaits in the underworld. These two beliefs are described in the Book of Two Ways that has existed since the Old Kingdom. The first outcome would be the deceased soul called the Ba, transforming into the sun god Ra. The Ba is one of three types of souls, the others being the Ka and the Ak. The Ba appears as a human with a bird's head that would then fly from the coffin out of the tomb into the heavens. The soul would return each night for safety as the sun set. The other outcome would involve a different soul called the Ka, which would require the dead to eat and drink to survive. This would also involve taking a different path than from the first outcome. The deceased would start out in the west called the Land of Life. Their journey would take them to the eastern sunrise to a place called the Field of Offering, where the deceased will meet Osiris. To assist in this journey, the dead are laid facing east with painted eyes on their coffin resembling Horus. The belief is that the dead can see out of the coffin through the eyes. The Field of Offering, also known as the Field of Reeds, offers the promise of rebirth. According to the coffin texts, spells and incantations placed in the Tomb of the Dead would help them in the afterlife. Passages from the coffin texts can even be found inside the coffin itself, including detailed maps of the underworld and how to cross the various seas. The underworld is full of obstacles such as demons, gates, waterways, and knowledge to master. But once they arrived at the Field of Offerings, the deceased were exposed to lush fields, watered farmland, orchard, and gardens, and peace for all eternity after one final test. The infamous story of the final judgment in the Hall of Truth is known across Egypt. For this last test, the deceased must present themselves in front of the Tribunal of Gods, Ma'at, Ra, and Osiris. The deeds of the deceased are to be weighed, and this is done by weighing the heart of the individual, which is also why the embalmers left the hearts inside mummies. The heart would be placed upon a set of scales, because the heart was seen to have stored all intellect, emotion, and memories. This is known as the weighing of the heart. On the other side of the scale was the Feather of Truth, from the goddess of Truth Ma'at. To pass this test, the scales must be balanced, but the test is made more difficult as the heart could spill out untruths or hidden truths. 
There are ways to combat this, from various spells to an ingenious invention of a beetle-shaped amulet with a human head that was introduced in the Middle Kingdom. The scarab beetle was seen as a sign of rebirth because young beetles hatch from a ball of dung, which to the Egyptians is a sign of decay and death. The amulet contained this protective spell engraved onto it. Do not stand up against me. Do not witness against me. Do not oppose me in the tribunal. Do not incline against me. If the dead soul was successful, then they would be placed in either one of two groups, those who are justified and those who are unjust. If the deceased is found justified, then they will be resurrected through Osiris and granted eternity to live among the field of offering. Here they are given a plot of land they need to maintain that would require intensive physical labor, but the crops here will always grow. Luckily, they can call upon Shoptees, which are small dolls buried with the dead that once called upon will manifest themselves into a worker that will help the dead on their farm. But they have a specific task depending on what the inscription on the doll says. For example, O Shopti, detailed to serve me, if I am summoned or if I am detailed to do any work that is to be done in the afterlife, you shall detail yourself to me every time whether for maintaining the fields, irrigating the banks, or ferrying sand from east to west. Look, here I am, you shall say. Throughout history, the Egyptians have undergone various changes in their religious beliefs, from the various texts preparing individuals for the afterlife to the pyramids solely built as tombs for pharaohs, and the practice of mummifying the dead to stand the test of time. The Egyptians will always have one of the most unique cultures in ancient history that will continue to be looked back upon for the remainder of human existence.